Good Tuesday morning. I hope that you're having a good morning in the Lord. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I hope that yesterday was a good exercise for you in reading through the whole letter at one time. And so remember our plan. We Yesterday we read through the whole letter in one sitting. Then we're going to take Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, going through each individual chapter. And then on Saturday, we will have the joy of, again, going back through and rereading the letter as it was meant to be read in one sitting with, with no interruptions in the middle. And so if you find it hard at your house to go through anything without any interruptions, know that my house is exactly the same way. So, um, if you have not already, this morning, read Philippians chapter 1. Go again. Now, I know you read it yesterday with chapter 2, 3, and 4. But today, go back and read just chapter 1. Now, this time, spend a little more time on words that you don't really understand or that you have questions about. If you want to look up words, go to blueletterbible.org. Just type in uh, the reference for the verse and you can look up. It's called interlinear. When you press on the word, it'll ask you if you want to see interlinear. In that, it will tell you what the word means. And uh, I guarantee you said, well, you'll probably tell us what the words mean. I will, probably. <laughs> However, you won't remember them as well if I tell you. If you go and you go do the work and you look it up and then we talk about it, what you'll find is it will really help solidify it in your own mind. The more time you spend, the more fruitful it will be. You can do a drive-by on this, but man, remember, the theme of this book is the joy of the Lord. And remember, joy is contentment. I am content with what God is doing in my life. It's very pertinent for us because remember where Paul is when he's writing this letter. He's in a Roman jail. Um, not necessarily the dungeon that we read about in Timothy. Uh, however, he's in a what, what is called a Roman house arrest. And there's different details, but we know that he's chained to at least one guard all the time. And so what was really cool is how the shift change within the Praetorian Guard. And so they would come, I think every six hours they would change shifts. And so maybe uh, it's arguable that there's one person that he's chained to. Some argue that there was two that he was chained to, but the idea is still the same, that every six hours, Paul got a new audience for the gospel. And it's, uh, if you look at history, there's almost an evangelistic revival going on in the Praetorian Guard over the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Why? Because of Paul's imprisonment. And so, as we look at chapter 1, remember this whole book, How Do I Have Joy in the Midst of Difficult Circumstances? And it's all focused around the mind. Now remember, love the Lord your God, the great commandment will lead to loving your neighbor, okay? How do I love my neighbor when I'm in difficult situations? Because I love God and he's controlling what I think, he's controlling what I'm trusting in, he's controlling my choices, my soul, and he's ultimately in control of my priorities, my heart. And so chapter one is going to tell us what Paul's single mind is. Okay. What, what is the, we talked about this Sunday when I was watching the golf tournament between Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods and Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. And Tom Brady was playing real bad and Charles Barkley uh, chimed in and he said, this is the greatest quarterback that's ever played football, but here's what I can tell you. Life is short and you can only really be good at one thing. In chapter 1, Paul's going to tell us what his one thing is. And as we look into it, I want you to examine in your own life, what's the one thing? What's the single-mindedness 
in your life. Not, I'm not asking you what you want it to be. I'm asking you what it is. If I, you were to die today, and you were to be in a casket, and your friends and family would come by you, and they would, some of them would stand up and talk about you. What would they talk about you? What would they say? What would be the thing that they saw was most important to you? Boy, when it comes time for me, I want people to know that God's word and the spread of the gospel was the most important thing in my life. When you go through difficult circumstances, and you sacrifice your own comfort, your own safety, uh, your own prosperity, physically speaking, to further the gospel, people know the sacrifice. So, uh, read chapter 1 and let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. May we have ears to hear this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. In normal fashion, Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who, who are in Philippi. So remember, Paul had, I believe, had eye problems, so he always has an amanuensis. It's just a fancy word for he's speaking the words, somebody else is writing them down. So here we know that Paul and Silas and Timothy went to Philippi. So here we have Paul and Timothy, who are called doulos, okay, bond servants. The doulos is a name for a slave, but it's a slave that chose to be a slave. Okay, so this isn't someone forced into slavery. This is someone who desires to serve as a slave at their own free will. They're the bond servants of Christ Jesus, and they're writing this letter to Christians. That's what the word saint means. Saint isn't somebody from New Orleans, okay? Saint here means, it's not somebody that when you see a picture of them, they have a halo behind their head. A saint is someone who is set apart. That's all the word means. It, it means someone who's in the middle of the sanctification process, okay? So, Largely, this letter is going to be about the sanctification process. How does one get into the sanctification process? It has to first begin with justification. So I have to surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. His spirit comes to dwell within me. Then I start being a saint. So he's writing to believers. He says, uh, including the overseers and the deacons, the pastors and the example servants, the lead servants. If you're a overseer, you're overseeing, the pastor's job is to make sure that the church is being obedient to the word. The deacons, the deacons aren't like co-parts uh, of the government, like we've got the house and we've got the senate and we've got the executive branch. That's not the way it is in the church. It, this is not a democracy. Who's in charge? Jesus Christ is in charge. He's the head. The, the pastor, the overseer, is teaching the word of God and watching the way things are being done to ensure that they're being done according to God's word. The deacons are not asked to do anything that everyone else is not asked to do. Everyone's supposed to be a servant. The deacons are supposed to be the examples that the rest of the body can look to and say, the deacons can say, follow me as I follow Christ. And what a tragedy it is when that is not true. Um, he says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the same greeting that Paul has been given, let's talk about it again. Peace is a Jewish term, shalom. Grace is more of a Roman term. However, both are, if we want peace, it's going to have to begin with peace with God. Even in the midst of all these riots that are going on right now in our country, people say, no justice, no peace. Well, the question is, how does one get justice? And in turn, then, how do we get peace? Well, remember, 
God says his character is about righteousness and justice. The great commandment, there it is. Righteousness, right with God. Justice, right with man. Okay, so here he's using, how do I get right with God? How do I have peace with God? It's going to take grace. It's going to be God giving me a gift that I don't deserve. Okay, so what is that gift? The gift is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, his death, burial, and resurrection, his substitution, his justifying me, his propitiation, his redemption, his forgiveness. All these words that we've been defining here lately. Um, why did Jesus die? So that I could have a relationship with Almighty God, with God the Father. So that's just the greeting. But there's a lot there. He goes on, he says, I thank my God. In all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy, there it is again, in, or first, in every prayer for you all, in view of what? He's, he's letting us know his single mind. What's the most important thing to Paul? I can tell you it's not his physical safety. It's not his uh, bottom line financial number. It's, it's not his uh, thought in the community, how people look at him. He is praying for them. He's, uh, he has joy, he's content. Now, why is he content with this church that he planted in Philippi? Because of their participation in the gospel. What does that mean? The gospel just means good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. This is the Great Commission. How is the Great Commission, which says, Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you, and I'm going to be with you as you do this. That's the delegated authority that God has given to every Christian. This is exactly what the pastor is supposed to be teaching God's Word, equipping every believer in his church so that they can go grow up and become reproducing parts of the body. They can participate in the gospel. And Paul is writing them saying, hey, I have such joy. I am so content where the church of Philippi is because they are actually participating in the gospel. They have gone from being infants, grown into toddlers, gone through the young adult stage, and now they are full reproducing parents participating in the gospel. This is Paul's one goal. Uh, this is also my goal. I have one desire, and that's to make disciples who will turn around and make disciples. If um, you say, well, what about people who just want to come and learn? I have no desire for people who want to be cesspools of knowledge. When the gospel really takes hold of a person's life, they will love God. They'll be in a communing relationship with God. They have encountered God. And once you encounter God, you want more of God. And so then that, they, if that's happening, you, it, you cannot stop that love from coming out to your neighbor. You cannot help it. It's going to come out. And so... If you are loving God and growing in your walk with God, you are going to get to the place of participating in the gospel. If you've been saved for years and not months and you are not participating in the gospel, there is a huge problem. Either you're lying about your walk with the Lord or God is lying. Because what he's saying is, if you're in a communing relationship with me and you're learning so much, it's going to come out in this way. It is in the Philipp Philippi church, and Paul is so excited about it. He has joy over it, even while he's in prison. Is it worth it for him to be in prison? It is, if the gospel is furthered. He goes on, he says, from the first day until now, what we read yesterday in Acts, uh, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. What God began in justification, he's going to carry all the way through to glorification. Right now, 
You are at the productive stage where you are participating. You are making disciples and it's exciting. Uh, for anyone, if I have discipled someone and to see them carrying on and making disciples, I can tell you uh, it's better than any adrenaline rush that you could ever get. This is the desire of every godly pastor. It's the desire of every godly person who is mature in Christ. They want to help others mature in Christ and then in turn see them help others. And then multiplication starts to happen. That's the goal. Now, um, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart, both in my imprisonment, in my defense, in my confirmation of the gospel. You all are partakers of the grace with me. Okay? Think about this. What's most important? God gave them all this gift of salvation, this grace. This gospel was preached to them and they received it and their eternal life is secure. And now all they want to do is love other people enough to share it with them. Paul says, my imprisonments, my confinements, my defense, everything is, is worth it when I see you carrying on in obedience to what you've been commissioned to do. Um, he says, for God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment. Now, think through this. We, we talked about faith, love, and hope. Faith is this, this vertical relationship with God, this abiding, John 15, the vine and the branches producing fruit. Faith, okay? What happens from that faith? Love for my neighbor comes out of that. And, and really this love for God is called faith because I can't see God. My hope is also by faith because I can't see what's ultimately gonna be glorification. So the only thing I can see right now is the love that's being produced for other people over the love that I have for myself. See, if I would love myself, I would be concerned about my own safety. I would be concerned about my own comfort. I would be concerned about protecting my life. But when, when God becomes in control, then his will becomes most important. And that will is the commission to share this with others so that others can know him. It says, hey, I grow in this love, that your love may abound more and more. You see, if, you, if you're a Christian, you really should not be struggling daily with sins of commission. We shouldn't be actively out committing rebellious sins every day against God. Now, am I saying that as Christians, we live sinlessly perfect lives? I would say no to that. We don't, but we should not be out rebelling against God and committing sins. What should we be doing? We should be depending on him. So the, the question then of sin every day should be more of sins of omission. And this is a great example. Okay, so if I look at my life yesterday, I can ask this question. Did I love my neighbor enough yesterday? And if I'm honest, each and every day as I wind up my day, I can examine places where I could have loved God more and in turn, I could have loved my neighbor more. And so here he's saying, hey, I want you to grow more and more in this love, in really knowing and discerning so that what? You may approve the things that are excellent. Okay, so remember this, this life is a kind of a minefield of distraction. Satan wants to get you off track so that you're focused on things that don't matter instead of being an ambassador trying to further the kingdom of God through the ministry of reconciliation. Go back and read 2 Corinthians 5. But he says, to be 
in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. This isn't sincere and blameless is not sinless. The word blameless is this idea of having no skeletons in my closet, meaning, yes, do I sin? I do. But I don't hide it. I am dealing with my sin. When the Holy Spirit convicts me, I confess sin and I repent of it. Um, he goes on and he says, until the day when Christ had him been filled with the fruit of righteousness. What is the fruit of righteousness? We've already talked about this, but let's again hit it one more time. The fruit of righteousness is another way of talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Go back and read Galatians 5, 22, 23. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, uh, patience, self-control. These things, these are the fruit that is produced from a right relationship with God. So it looks like this. I'm in God's Word. God's Spirit is in me. God's Spirit is using the Word of God to convict me of sin in my life. Things that the world could look at me and blame me. Okay, how do I get blameless? I respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit by confessing my sin. First, I confess my sin to God. Then if I sin against you, I come confess my sin to you. And then I have an overall uh, confession, an honesty about who I am and what I struggle with. Okay, so remember though, confession always has to be coupled with repentance. Confession without repentance is just bragging about my sin. So not only do I speak openly and try to get sin right, but I don't walk in sin. I'm not practicing sin. I've repented of it, meaning if I was lying, that would be walking this way. And when I repent, I turn from that lie in confession and I go the other way in truth. So the when I am in this process, what we've been calling, and I, it's kind of just morphed into CCR. When I'm in that process, the whole purpose of that, because you might say, well, why do I have to confess my sin if God has already forgiven me my sin and he's already, uh, you know, I'm saved. Remember, this process is conforming a sinner to look like Christ. So there's a humbling process. So... The lost world is sinning against each other all the time and causing wreckage in everybody's life. And they never deal with it. But the Christian starts to see the gravity of sin and the, the, the destructive uh, results of sin because we're now going and confessing and repenting of sins. We're, we're, we're seeing. When you start to get sin right, you start seeing how it impacts so many people. And it just brings you, the Holy Spirit helps you to bring you. And it's a humbling thing. In that, while you're down there, there's the comfort of Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation. You're, you don't have to be afraid of hell. But there's also the comfort of the, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, then once I'm humbled, he can produce these Christ-like traits in my life to help further me in love for each other and for the lost world. So he says, this comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So at the end of all that process, it can't possibly be me saying, look at me and look how good I am. It comes to the place of saying, God's mercy and God's grace is massive. So we go on for that. He says, now I want you to know, brethren, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of what? Paul's single mind is the furtherance of the gospel. What has he prayed for in Ephesians 6? He's in prison. He's asking them to pray for him, not praying that he would get out of prison. He's praying that God would give him clear clarity and boldness to speak the gospel. What's most important to Paul is the furtherance of the gospel, and he is willingly sacrificing his own body and comfort to get this. And this isn't just what Paul is called to. 
Every one of us have been called to this joy of the Lord. You really want joy? You're going to have to be single-minded. Single-minded on what? Not on your job, not on your family, not on your comfort, your, not on your life. The single-mindedness of the believer is on the furtherance of the gospel. Um, so that, he says, my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well-known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So Paul's saying, hey, I see glimpses of why God has me in prison. First, there are people, these hardened Roman guards in the Praetorian circle are getting saved. God's doing that. And he said, also, as I'm in prison, uh, speaking forth the gospel. People are coming and seeing me and they're hearing about what's going on in the prison. And he said, and there, even though they're still at their jobs, still at their own communities, they're not in prison. But remember, maybe early on I was caught up in fear, not wanting to share the gospel. But if Paul can do it even in prison, then I can do it in my own neighborhood. That's what's going on here. It's, it's so cool. It says, some to be sure. Now, verse 15 is the kind of the turn. There are some people who are seeing what Paul's doing and they are on board furthering the gospel too and that brings him great joy. Paul would love to say every one of the people that he has taught are doing this, but verse 15 says, some are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. Why are they preaching the gospel? Not to further themselves, but to get money, to get influence, to be a big deal. We see the same thing today, okay? Uh, people want big churches. Why do they want big churches? Well, we say we want lots of people to come to know Christ, but in most churches, the people that come to Christ are not being discipled in turn to then make disciples. They're just taught to come and get addicted to the program. Why do we want so many people coming addicted to the program? Well, to be honest, as pastors, I can get a bigger salary and I can have a, a, a more influence in Christian circles if I have a big church versus a small church. But really, all that is off track. All that is using the world's wisdom and the world's way, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, lowering the standard of Christ. To do God's work, that's ridiculous. But he says here, some people are, are preaching Christ for envy and strife, but some from goodwill. The latter do it out of love for others, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So some, just like Paul is loving people, they are loving people. But the others, they're proclaiming Christ out of selfish ambition. Now, if you remember back when we studied James 3 and 4, it says if, there, where, if you have conflict and quarrels, where did that come from? If you have division and strife, he's, we know where that comes from. It doesn't come from Christ. It comes from envy, jealousy, selfish ambition. Okay? So... He says, not from pure motives. They're wanting something for themselves. They're using God instead of serving God. Remember, God, you, we don't get to use God. God uses us. Don't get that confused. This is thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Um, so they're talking bad about Paul. If he really was a servant of God, he wouldn't be in prison. But he says, what then? Only that in every way. The people in pretense, the people that are even out there sharing Christ from poor motives, God can even use that. If people are out there with pure motives in the truth, he says, all I know is that Christ is being proclaimed and in this I have great joy. What's the single mind of Paul? How can he be in prison and still be content with God? Is because the priority 
is God, of loving God and making God known in the gospel. He goes on, yes, I will rejoice for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. He says, I know I'm in prison, but I know God's going to deliver me. Now, here's the thing. Uh, this can go for anything that happens in our lives that we don't really like. I know if I'm being 100% obedient to the commission that God has called me to do, I am actively making disciples. Let's say I'm in prison. I know God's going to deliver me. Let's say I get physically sick. Let's say I get cancer. I can say God's going to deliver me. I know that God will deliver me. Now, there's two ways that God could deliver somebody in prison or somebody who's sick. He could get me out of prison or heal me physically. Or I could die in prison or die of the illness. Either way, I'm getting deliverance. And that's Paul's focus here. Look what he says. He says, through your prayers and provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope. So they're praying, right? But what is his expectation and his hope? Well, his expectation and hope initially is for the spread of the gospel, but ultimately his expectation and hope is glorification. So either way, his deliverance is good. He's set. He doesn't have to be afraid. Okay, What should they be praying for? Remember, he's not asking them to pray that, they would, that he would get out of jail or out of prison. What he's praying for is let's all pray that God would use all of us even at great sacrifice, to spread the gospel, that the gospel would be furthered. He goes, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether either deliverance that I get, whether by life or death. You get the point? And then it's kind of summed up. His single mind is this, verse 21, for me to live is Christ, and what? To die is gain. When you read that verse, how does it impact you? Did you do you think Paul is insane? Or does this really strike a chord with you about what it's going to be like someday? When we lay aside this sinful tent and get a glorified body who's going to be able to worship God fully in spirit and in truth. I can tell you this. If you're not embarking on a daily communing walk with God, that you're not going to understand this verse. But if you are embarking on a daily walk with God, and you're going through the process daily of CCR and this humbling nature, you cannot wait to worship God without the hindrance of your sin nature. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to worship God without your mind going on tangents, without distractions, without desires of, that aren't right, that are... I can't wait. He says, but if I'm to live on the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. So again, he's saying, it's, I'm going to stay in my lane. Whether I go to heaven or whether I stay here on earth, really not my deal. It's deliverance either way. Why? Because I have one goal, and that's to further the gospel. So if God keeps me on earth, there's going to be fruitful labor to do. There's plenty of work to do. He goes on, he says, and I, and I do not know which to choose, but I'm hard pressed for both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is necessary for your sake. So get the great commandment right there. He says, I love God and I can't wait to go be with Christ. But yet... Through my love for God, he's given me this love for other people. And there's so many people that don't know about Christ that I, I want to I wanna share that with them. And so he says, I'm in, a, I'm in a dilemma. I'm in a quandary. And it's a good thing that he's not in control of it. Remember, 
I don't get to control when I am delivered to go to heaven or when I'm delivered to get out of jail. What am I in charge of? My spiritual growth and seeking to further that with someone else. Paul's doing that. It's his single mind. He says this. Look at verse 25. Um, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in what? In the faith. Okay, so he's writing this letter saying, I know God, it, God is seemingly making it clear to me that even in writing this letter, okay, he's not saying he's going to get out of jail, but God's given him a little more life here on earth. Why? For the progress of others in their joy, in their walk with God. That other people could start having the same single mind that, that Paul has and much more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that what? Your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you. I, I want to come to you again. He doesn't know whether that's going to be able to happen. But guess what? His desire is to not have to do this in letter form, but to do it face to face. Only, he says, the progress in the faith and your joy really is this, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In every area of our lives, our single-minded focus has to run through the filter of, okay, let's just say, should I, uh, should I meet with the church? Yes, I should, because if I don't meet with the church, it's, not, it's gonna hurt my witness. Should I drink alcohol? Uh, no, I shouldn't drink alcohol. Why? Because it might hinder my witness. The single-minded folk in every area of my life, I'm asking myself the question, is this gonna hinder the furtherance of the gospel from my life to other people? And whatever it is in my life that may hinder that, I wanna get rid of. That's the idea here, and it's exciting. He says this, um, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Go back and read Ephesians chapter four. There's one Lord, one faith, one body, one church, one God and Father, all of this. And if we have this, for part of this one mind, it's going to be all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now remember, I can't just be born again and start being a reproducing parent. I have to go through the process of growth. And he's wanting them to, he's excited that they are continuing on all the way to full maturity where they are participating in the gospel. They are making disciples of someone else. They did not, as the Jesus would say in the parable, they didn't bury their talent. Their, your talent is your life, your physical life. You've got your one life. God saved you. You've got that one. Now he wants you to multiply that by going through full maturity to becoming a productive participant in the gospel. Look what he says. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. Remember, he said, there's some that are out there preaching the gospel uh, to make money. He says, that says more about them and where they're going to end up. Than, but if they're opposed to you, that's probably a good sign that it's really the Holy Spirit working in you. If everyone is speaking well of you, then I can tell you, you're not standing firm. Paul wrote to Timothy, said, everyone who uh, seeks to live godly will be persecuted. Maybe not to the extent that Paul was, but you will experience it in one degree or another. It says this, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also what? To suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. I can tell you this, you will never suffer for Christ if you don't really love Christ. 
But if you are willing to lose your security, lose your material possessions, and even lose your life, you're starting to scratch the surface of what it looks like uh, to be fully sold out and to have the single mind of Christ. And so if you want joy as a Christian, you say, I've surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, but I don't really have any joy in my life. I can tell you what. You are not a reproducing Christian. And you will never experience the joy of the Lord until you become a participant in the gospel. That means, go back to 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. It talks about, I'm born as an infant. All I know is that my sins are forgiven and now it's supposed to be about his name, not my name. But then I grow into being a toddler, so I start to walk in this process of CCR, of practicing righteousness, of, uh, of faith and repentance and what this looks like. Um, I grow to being a young adult where now the Word of God is implanted in me. It's part of me. I'm drawing strength from the Word of God, and I'm overcoming these temptations that have beset me most of my life. And then from that I grow into continuing my relationship with God and getting to know Him. But in that, I'm reproducing and making disciples. And that's the goal. If you've stopped short, if you've been a Christian again for month, for years and not months, and you have not grown to full maturity, then I can tell you, then you don't have any joy. It becomes about, you know, work it comes about serving the lord at some committee or it becomes about the work okay well the work has everything to do with making disciples and if we're doing all the work but we're never making disciples we're never going to have any joy and god wants us to have joy but as long as our priorities are different than his priorities we're never going to experience his joy however if we do start to have his priorities, it won't matter what circumstances you find yourself in life, you can have the joy of the Lord. And so, you know that old song, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 The, the, is my strength. the only way that can happen is if you will come to full maturity and become a participant in the furtherance of the gospel. And Paul would look at us as he's looking at the, the believers in Philippi saying, hey, even though I'm in prison, you bring me great joy in seeing you reproducing for the kingdom of God. The gospel is moving forward. Now, I can't save anybody, neither can you. All we can do is sacrifice our lives to share the gospel. And then when the gospel happens, look what we looked at yesterday with Lydia. When you share the gospel, certain people are, God's going to open their eyes and they're going to surrender their lives. Sometimes what's going to open their eyes is seeing the sacrifice that we will make and the, the different the, the way we are different from the world. When Paul and Silas were in jail, they had a chance to escape, yet they didn't. That opened the door. Their physical pain and the natural response of payback, when they didn't do that, it opened a door for them to share the gospel and for the Philippian jailer to be open. And what flowed from that? The church. A joyful church in Philippi. Boy, I want a joyful church in Rockingham, North Carolina, or wherever you live. May God honor the reading of his word. Father, we love you. We thank you for Paul's imprisonment. We thank you for his single mind, furthering your gospel, furthering the good news about who you are and what your son Jesus Christ has done. So, Father, may we be active participants. Grow us to that point, Father, and then help us to get to know you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great Tuesday.